Everlasting fire. Have you ever thought, do the wicked really burn forever? Have you ever thought, how can a just God require eternal punishment for a sin that has only been committed for 70 or 80 years? Or perhaps you've thought, the scripture is clear about everlasting fire, and the scripture is also clear about everlasting life. If I deny that the everlasting fire is perhaps only temporary, or it doesn't really last forever, then couldn't I also conclude that everlasting life also wouldn't last forever? This concept of everlasting fire has confused many people, and it's important for us as Christians that we rightly divide the word of truth, that we compare scripture with scripture so that we're not ashamed. And the Bible gives us some very clear indications that this fire, everlasting fire, is what is going to happen at the end of the world. Some people believe that it's now, but the scripture in Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, it talks about the world that now is and this earth is reserved unto fire to the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. So this day, this, this planet is reserved for a certain day, a certain time, and we know that when Jesus comes, he will bring his reward with him. His re we don't get rewarded for our evil works or our good works until Jesus comes. And even in the scripture in Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, The Lord knoweth how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So we can see that there is a day of punishment. There is a day that is coming, the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. And this is future. But as for the eternal fire, it says that the elements will melt with fervent heat and that all the works of this earth will be burned up. And so we want to consider this type of fire. And in Jude 6 and 7, it gives us an example, something to look back onto. It talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. And they were living in fornication and the lust of the flesh. And they suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. For an example of us, the whole Old Testament is an example for the ends of the world. We can read that in Corinthians. But looking back at Sodom and Gomorrah, we see that this fire that came from heaven came from the presence of God. If we read there in Genesis chapter 19 verse 24, that God rained fire from the God of heaven. And also when we look at the Old Testament typology, we can see in Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 1 and 2 that when Nadab and Abihu went before the Lord, they were offering strange fire. It says that the fire came out from from the Lord, from this most holy place, the Shekinah glory. This fire came out and just devoured them and killed them. We also have another example in the Old Testament when Elijah was to build an altar and to pray and offer a sacrifice and whichever God answered by fire was the true God. And so Elijah had these stones and, and the offering and the wood and put water on it and then he knelt down and prayed and the scripture says and fire came out from God and devoured the offering and the, and the wood and even the stones and the scripture says that the dust of the earth was consumed. So we can see this fire consumes the ungodly people of Sodom and Gomorrah that walk after the lusts of the flesh, but also religious people who haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ are also consumed in the last days because these things were an example of what would happen in the future. And we also see that the elements, the rocks and the dust, would also be consumed with the fire of God. And so we think, wow, these three examples... All three examples say that the fire came from God. And we think, how can that be? But when we consider Hebrews chapter 12, it says our God is a consuming fire. And when we look at the throne of God in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9, starting later in the scripture, it says, His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. So here we read that the throne of God, this is fire, the fiery stream is issuing out from God. And there are people, there, there, there are angels that are ministering unto him. And even in verse 13, the Son of Man comes before him. So he comes into this presence of this fire, this consuming fire. And so we get a little understanding of what the, the uh, destruction of the wicked will be like. When we read Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9, the destruction of Lucifer, fire comes out from God and devours them. 
as it says there. So God is this consuming fire. The fire that comes from God is to be the torment of the wicked. And in Revelation 14 verse 10, it says that those who receive the mark of the beast and the image and so forth have the torture day and night in the presence of the Lamb and of the angels, and the smoke of this torment rises up forever and ever. So the presence of the Lamb, Jesus, God, the angels, all is a torment to evildoers, to sin, to anything that is sinful. The earth is being cursed with sin, and therefore when God comes, this earth will burn up, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And so when we read in the Gospels, in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 29, Jesus comes to a demoniac, has demons in him, he crosses the sea, he comes and he runs down and the demon says, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? And here's an interesting concept that this devil brings forth. You're here and you're coming to torment me before the time? There is obviously a time that they know that they're reserved unto. And Jesus' presence is some sort of, Are you coming to torment me? The presence of God is a torment to the wicked. And perhaps you can relate to this even when you were at school and someone in the class was always good and perhaps you were doing wrong. And when someone's really good, it just irritates you and annoys you. And, it, and it's some sort of torment. Even the story of the first brothers on this planet, Cain and Abel. Cain was wicked, Abel was righteous, and Cain just got really annoyed. It was a torment to him and he slew his brother. And so it is, this righteousness and wickedness, they are opposed. The spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit and they're contrary one to another. And so when you put them together, there's this torment. And we also read that Jacob and Esau was also an example. And in Obadiah 18, Jacob would be to Esau as a fire, as it says, a typology of good tormenting the bad, if you like. And so... This eternal fire that is the presence of God, does God ever go out? Does God ever cease to be burning? And here in Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 14, it asks the question and it answers it in verse 15. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Who is it that will be alive during this everlasting burnings? This is the question. Is it the, the sinners who are afraid or is it God's people? Who will be alive in this everlasting fire, the fire of God's presence which never goes out? It says in verse 15, He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. So here we have a fire that cannot destroy God's people and it will devour the wicked like in Obadiah, it says in verse 16 that they will be as though they were not. They will consume away, but the fire will not stop. And so the wicked will be turned into ashes. There will be no more of them, but the fire will continue. It is everlasting. The, the torture and suffering is not everlasting. The scripture doesn't teach that. And so when we compare scripture with scripture, we see that this everlasting fire is something that the righteous will be living in and with pleasure and joy. So it's the challenge to you and me to prepare our lives to meet God and he will purify us and allow him to purify us so that when he, when he comes, we will be able to see him as he is and not die. May God bless you. Amen.